midterms uh, are graded. The midterm solution is posted. Um, I did want to go over one of the problems, which was um, especially bad, I guess. The word. There were a number of problems in it that people had, so I wanted to go over that. And that was um, going ahead and using important sampling. So we had uh, a off pol sorry a, pol a behavior policy that went ahead and did these actions. I got these time steps, and so we had that particular episode. And then these were the particular it's just equal probable, right? And then we had the uh, policy that we were trying to evaluate. So the discount factor was one, to try and make life easy for you. Um, my initial setup on this problem was I had one problem with like two episodes and you had to do all the different kinds of ways of doing things and there was a uh, discount factor and that turned to be way too complicated so I broke it down to try and isolate kind of what I wanted. So in this case, uh, what is, what's our total reward, Nick? For this episode. Oh, sorry. 22. 22 sounds good, right? 8 plus 10 plus 4. Total reward. In fact, we could even say total discount reward, right? It's 22 because the discount factor is 1. So that's one way life is easier. First thing, when we're using important sampling, we don't like break up the rewards. And so this is probably the key problem people had was saying, okay, I'm going to take the 8 reward and I'm going to look at the ratio for A1S1 between pi and B and multiply that by that reward. And then use the next A2S2 ratio and multiply that by 10 and so on. That's not how we do it, right? We're Monte Carlo, we look at the entire reward and then we just multiply it by the probability of that trajectory of that episode happening with the two different um, policies. Right? So the, we have basically a, an A1 given S1, right? What's the probability of that? Times within an S2A2 times, right, S3A1. And if we're looking at the ratio of the pi's over the b's, Does that make sense? And so this ratio, right, basically we've got A1S1 is one quarter of one half times S2A2 times S3A1. Well, it kind of depended here whether you <laughs> use this column or this column. It was pretty unfortunate that this happened, um, but either one I marked as right. So I'm going to use this one. Just Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one person pointed out, uh, corrected that, uh, and then it was 50-50 as to when people use column one and column two. So, um, so equals one half times two times one half, which is a total of one half, right? So it tells us that this is more likely in policy B than it is in policy pi, and so therefore we should underweight our total of 22. So weighted by ratio equals 22 by 1 half, which equals 11. Does that make sense? OK. So make sure that if you got that wrong, that you know how to do that. OK. And then the next one was on the per decision important sampling. Right? And that we do get into particular weights. So let me remind myself what these weights are. These are 8, 10, and 4. And so here we look and say, OK, for these particular weights, sorry, for these particular rewards, how many of them don't depend on some of the factors in this term? Right? So if we look at the first reward we get at 8, 
It depends on our A1 given S1, but it doesn't depend on this. And so therefore, we're going to take 8 times 1 half plus then 10 times, it depends on these two, but not this one, so 10 times 1 half times 2, and then 4, the last rule is going to depend on all three. And I realized I left off one more problem, and that was because we actually had in part A two questions. Right? It was not just what's V, it's also what's Q. And most of you just said, well, V is equal Q. But V is not equal Q. Okay, let me explain why. If we look at V of A1, Right? Basically, if we look at VB of A1 and sort of V pi of A1, our estimate for BV of A1 is 22. Is that supposed to be a C? First off, that's an S. That's an S. And your question is? Was that? Uh, oh, that was a question. OK. So we multiply by what is the probability of having achieved this in uh, the sequence of events in pi, and it's half of what it is in v. Okay, right, we got that. But it's different than if we look at q, because if we look at q s1a1 with respect to b and q pi s1a1, in both of these we are saying, given that we're taking a1 and s1, I don't care how we got there or what policy we used to get there, from then on we're following the policy. So therefore, this part doesn't matter because for both of these, we're saying we don't care about the policy. The policy does not affect the choice of A1 in S1. It does affect from then on the choice of A2 and S2 and A1 and S3. So therefore, we lose this factor. And so we're back to... Right? This is 22, and this is 22 times 2 times 1 half. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a, I agree it's confusing, but just keep in mind that definition of Q. Take the action in the state, then follow the policy. So that's the one I wanted to really note of all the problems. And I enjoyed uh, reading about your different uh, sort of uh, exploration versus exploitation uh, in real life. So that was fun. Restaurants and studying and what classes to take and all that stuff. So. OK, I wanted to go over maximization bias again. So let's say our job is to estimate the average height of How did I how did I word this? I worded this much better, just a second. Yeah, okay, so uh, or let's just say estimator. Find average height of the class with maximum average height. Okay? That is very similar, right, to the problem we have of, for instance, trying to find the max action, right, the value of the max action. So let's say we've got a class, and these are heights along here, and the dots are different samples. So this is, let's say, our basketball class. And we've also got our jockey class, right? 
So the way these are done, no matter which element we take from here, right, which sample we take from the ba basketball, then we take a different sample from the jockey, the basketball sample is going to be higher than the jockey sample. So we could assume, yes, this will be the, correctly the maximum class. And if this were the scenario, then whatever instance we chose would be a reasonable choice as the average. Okay, does that make sense? Right, we choose one, we choose these. They don't overlap at all. This group is always going to win. So from this group, the sample we took is a reasonable representative average. But the problem comes about if we've got, let's say, a, I don't know, baseball class as well. Class team, I don't know what we're... I don't know how I got them. I guess because the math and CS, the average height's probably not that different. Okay, so we've got here some baseball. Right, now, if we take let's say we take a sample from here and take a sample from here, and the baseball one wins. It's not correct. It isn't actually the class that has the highest average. But we could end up with a case where we take a tall person from the baseball class and a shorter person from the basketball class. And the baseball class would win. And our best guess would be, OK, this class has the highest average height. However, so we pick this guy. So we pick this guy and this guy, okay? And this is higher, so this one wins. Is this a good estimate of the height of the people in this class? No, by design, this one is a big one, right? This one is an extreme one. So by design, This one is extreme. Okay, So not a good choice to say, what's the average of the folks in here? What would be a good choice for what's the average? Once, if I decide baseball's the winner, what's the best way to find from the folks on the baseball team, what's the average height? What's one way? I'm going to say, just don't take this guy. right? or person. So don't take a person and say, is this person taller than people from all these other groups? And if so, say that's a, a reasonable representative of this class. Instead, pick, close your eyes, randomly send someone out of the class, measure their height. Okay, I close my eyes, I pick one, it's that one. Oh, it's right in the middle, that was lucky. So, does that, does that make sense? why we are biasing our estimate. Because if we've got a, right, another way we can look at it is now we can look at, let's say, the math class and the CS class, which we assume are distributed roughly equally. <coughs> right. We pick a random one here, we pick a random one here. This one's higher. Right? Which of these classes are we choosing? The one we happen to choose a larger sample. So we're biasing towards choosing the class that has the representative that's higher. So don't say this is the estimate. Pick again to get an estimate. So in terms okay. of like, uh, translating this to actually like, like say it's actions, would like choosing baseball be like So these are equivalent to our value estimates, right? Or our Q estimates, our value estimates. So our value estimates 
um, when we are going ahead and doing Q learning, right, we say Q of And then here we have a max, right? A of Q of S prime A. It's this choice right here. These are our courses, our estimates for S prime for the given actions. All right. There's um, randomness in it. And when we try and choose the max, we're finding the one that's the highest class equivalently. But then we're also saying, and that estimate is a good estimate. So fine to use the max to find which is the right class, but don't then use that same value to say that's the, est the true estimate of that class. So look, yeah. Uh, can you do this process like several times to get like, a more accurate, like for example, Let's say with the basketball, baseball example, like sample once and then like sample three times sure. and then like yeah. take like the majority or something. Yeah, you can, you can always take multiple samples and that will give you better bounds on the mean. But that's sure. not what this does. This only does one. This does one. This says we're separating the job, we're separating our estimate of which is the best one which is the best class versus what is a good estimate of it. I guess like, um, you know, a reason for just using this kind of like approximated idea of the a good estimate would be for efficiency. But if we are still taking the max, like isn't that already a linear time step? Like why not just average all of them? So let's look at the estimate that we have as, it's an estimate, right, drawn from some distribution. So all our estimates are just estimates okay. drawn from some distribution, really based on our prior experience, right? What was the sequence of episodes that we had to get us to these cues that we have right now? It's not, we, we could try and come up with multiple versions of those by doing different episodes. So essentially we don't, we don't have like the whole cohort. And even when we're, when we're taking the max, it's not like the max within the cohort, it's just the max across our samples from the different cohorts. Right, what we've got is, is basically, so let's, let's look at really mapping this to value functions. What we've got are, so this is Q of S A1, and this is Q of S A2, and this is Q of S A3. And really, the red guy is Q of S of A3. It is what we happened to have gotten as our estimate. If we had used different episodes or different steps within the episodes, we might have ended up with this choice, or this choice, or this choice, right? Our Q could have been different. This is all the possible Qs, if we kind of look at what it, it might have been. And this is the one we have. And this is the one we have for A2. And this is the one we have for A1. Okay. The best way we know of which is the best action is just pick from here and look and see which is the highest. That's reasonable. But if we then say, and that's our best that's a good estimate of the value, we're biased. Okay, let's look at the code for what we're going to do to try and fix the bias. Basically, what we're going to have is we're going to just keep, along with this, another <coughs> estimate. Okay, so we're going to keep two estimates, a red instrument and a green inst estimate. And they just get chosen, they, they are independent of one another. Because we're going to use different transitions, different pieces of the episode to update them. So they will never have the same information that updates both of them. So they'll be completely independent. So there's one, and I don't know, I close my eyes, and that's one, and I close my eyes, and that's one. And 
if these are my three possible actions, and I choose the highest red one, I'll get this. But I'm say that's not my estimate for what this is worth. My estimate for what this is worth is the green one. Or if I look at the other way around, it could be if I chose the green ones, the highest one is this one. But I'm not going to use that as the estimate because it's biased. I'm going to use the red one. So my selection process with the max causes bias. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to basically go through we, the policy that we're going to use is a combo policy. Okay, we have two policies, basically two sets of Qs, or Q1s and Q2s, each with their own estimates. And we'll use, let's say, the average of those as our choice of what to do. It turns out it doesn't matter whether we sum them or sum them divide by two. The divide by two is not strictly necessary, but let's just think of it as the average. So we're going to add, use the average values and be epsilon greedy with that. Okay. And then every time we take an action, we observe a reward and a state, and then we'll just either update Q1 or Q2. It would not be good to, on odd steps, update Q1 and on even steps, update Q2. Because maybe our MDP is such that there's actually a correlation between some of those. So we just, with probability one half, either update Q1 or update Q2. So we'll have two independent estimates. Does this part make sense? Right? There's just updating Q1, Q2, we have two independent estimates. Even just given this, we're better off than we were because we'll now have two estimates of what the value is instead of one estimate of what the value is, and so they should be more accurate. And then now we're going to get rid of that maximization bias. We're going to say we will figure out the max Q1. So let's say Q1 is red and Q2 is green. Green. So we have flipped our coin and decide we're going to update the reds. So we're going to find the highest red action. That'll give us this action. And now that action, so that's the highest red, and the action is that first action. And now we're going to say, OK, what's our estimate of that action with our other estimator, with our other key? So that'll basically say, Get this screen. Use that as our value. So twice the memory. Uh, each of these is updating less quickly because we're only updating half the time. On the other hand, we do have the average that we're using. And this thing is not biased. Why does the bias matter? Because maybe we're going to tend to try and choose some actions that we shouldn't choose. Right? We think if we go over in that part of our maze that some good things will happen. But actually, it's not good. <coughs> Questions? And in the example they use in the book, there's a bunch of different actions. Because the more actions you have, the more variability is, the more there'll be some extreme maximum value. And then you'll be using that as your estimate. And you're still guaranteed to try every action for every state because it's back at epsilon greedy? Since it's epsilon greedy, we'll try every action for every state. And since we have this probability here as well, we're going to update Q1 and Q2 for every action that we so, so in the case where you chose the baseball for us and you get the maximum, eventually you'll do the basketball and then that that's actually a better action kind of thing? Eventually we'll be trying it, right? Eventually what will happen is, yeah, we, we will be 
doing more episodes that use this Q and S1. And so we should expect to see some of these other values in here. Or rather, over here, expect to see if some of these, yeah, we'll see them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this one will decrease. This one will increase. All right, now let's get into in-step TD. Also called TD of N. So the backup diagram that we've been using for TD looks like this, right? We take one step, we get a reward, we get a new state, and we take an action. So we update the value of SA based on the reward and then our estimate of the value of being in state A prime, S prime and taking the action A prime. So TD, well, let's also cut TD zero. And then we have over here on a car wheel, where we have, uh, let's say, I'm not going to look at the Q version of this. Sorry, I'm going to look at the V version. The Q version and the V version are similar, but never mind, I will. I change my mind. We're staying there. So here we go. We go to R, then S prime, and basically we just keep going until eventually we get to a thermal state. Right? Advantages of the Monte Carlo? Uh, we can give me an advantage of Monte Carlo over TD. <coughs> Both of them actually work well. Yeah. yeah, both of them work well. Episodic cases, I guess both can work for that. Yeah, exactly. Both can work. So yeah. you're you're identifying that correctly. So what? So once you actually end an episode and get to a terminal state, how many updates are we doing? How many Q values are we updating? One. So I guess in this case. Yeah. In this case, how many are we update? Uh, yeah, we'll forget the double learning. Okay, yeah. So, but how many states have we, we got a bunch of states, right? Or a bunch of state action pairs that we visited along the way. We're going to update all of them we saw. Right. Here, if we go through an episode, well, at each step, we're only updating one. Okay? And here we update all the way. But that's at the end. That's true. That's at the end. So we will really update every little delta depending on what's happened along the way. Say we got a maze and we have a start and we have an end and it's plus one discount 0 0.9. So zero everywhere else, right? We move, let's say this is our episode. We just get lucky. <clears throat> we go there. How many of these arrows does Monte Carlo update? They all started, let's say they all started at zero. How many of them are going to turn non zero in Monte Carlo? All of them. All of them. How many are going to turn non zero in TD? Which one? The last. Exactly, the last one. Because everyone else is going to say, I got a reward of zero. My estimate of my new state is zero. I update, I'm still zero. 
I got an updated reward of zero. My estimate is zero, still zero. All the way to the very last guy. When we get here, we say, I got a reward of one. Oh, I'll update myself. Okay. Yeah. So basically, is, this just kind of like points out that bootstrapping can be like unreliable when we have no boots. It's bad. But like I said, like, we're kind of like not doing anything for a little while. We're not doing anything for a little while, yeah. Yeah, it's bootstrapping without the boots. Um, so there, you can imagine something intermediate to this, right? Something where, when we got to the end, in this particular situation, we did update this one, and this one, and that one, for example. So that at every step, you weren't using just the immediate reward and the next estimate. You were using, let's say, the next two rewards and the estimate from there, or the next three rewards and the estimate from there. So that's what is in between here. So we get a reward here, and we get a reward here. And then we'll go ahead and take our value two steps from here. Or, in general, n steps. Right. So if this is n steps, <coughs> this is TDN. And actually, the idea is TDN. We call this TD0 and not TD1 for no particular good reason that I know. So when we do it for the whole process, does let's say we go n step TD, right? Where n is everything. Um, then is that then the same thing as Monte Carlo if we go all the way to terminal state before we start state? TD infinity is Monte Carlo. Because right? TD Infinity says we're going to update basically once we get to the terminal state. Nice. TDN is not quite Monte Carlo right? because of the fact that we could have a continuing, a, a, a non-episodic task. And as long as we took n steps, then that would allow us to do an update. Okay. Now a key here is... We can't update right away. But we don't have enough information at the time we take a time step to actually update. So if we are in S0 and we take action A0, then we're going to get reward 1 and we know we're going to be in action 1. Um, let's look at our V. Right, so v at a0 equals v at a0 Let's say we're doing two step. Yeah. Should that be s? You know, what is it? That's twice today, huh? Thank you. So actually, let's just look at it. This is one step. Right, so that's okay. We could do this one step right away. But if we're doing two step, then we've got R1, we've got a discounted R2, and then we've got a doubly discounted V of S what? We don't even have R2 yet, do we, right? So we've got to take action one, get R2, get S2, and then we have enough information. And this, of course, is not quite correct because we've got to subtract our original estimate, right?
So in practice, how does this work? You take a time step, right, starting at the beginning, and you don't update anything. You just save the information. In fact, if you're doing in step TD, you take n steps, saving, 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 doing nothing, and then after that in step, you can do an update of the first one. And then every time, take a step, save the information, update in back. Take a step, update, update in back, and so on. Uh, so you're keeping basically the rolling buffer, so even real-time systems require the logic. Or if it's requiring end memory. It's requiring end memory, yeah. It's not, it's not that bad, right, because it's really just the state action reward times n. So it's not like some states times action. So. All right, so let's look at kind of how this works. It's, 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 uh, this is sort of this, this for, in some way it's forward looking. I don't know whether we want to think of it as forward looking or backward looking, right? We're, think of it as forward looking, let's say. We're here at time step T and we look forward in time the next and time steps to see where we end up. Right. In practice, of course, we can't look in the future, and so we have to just save, 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 and then go back and accumulate. So, This algorithm has a lot of technic subtle technicalities to it. So it needs to work both in a continuing or episodic case. So again, we've got this. After we have the first n steps, here's actually how I would look at it. Unless we're done, that is, we've reached a terminal state, we take a step. And then we look back n steps and say, as we look back at those end steps, is there actually anything back there, right? Is that before we even started, before time step zero or not? If it's before time step zero, we don't do anything. Otherwise, we go back and update that one. And then take another step, look back, end time steps, update. Take another step, look back, update. Eventually, we may become terminal, right? We reach a terminal state. In which case, we've still got to work through those last n um, time steps and update those. And those will all be updated just as if it's Monte Carlo, right? because they're going all the way through the end of the episode. So the first part of this is just basically Taking a time, taking an action, saving it. And if we reach a terminal step, that tells us how many total steps we're going to need to do. Okay. The algorithm is also really useful, especially if you're reading out loud, because it distinguishes between capital T, lowercase t, which is the time step, and tau, which is the one that we are updating that we're looking back n steps through. What is capital T? Capital T represents the, oh, the number of time steps. Yeah. Okay. So it could be infinite if it's episodic. Sorry, if it's continuing. And if it's episodic, and we only know that because it happens to end, then it tells us what our, what our cutoff is. So t will get updated, but it starts out as infinite. So once we find out it's finite, we'll go ahead and stop. Um, and the number, we take an action, and then we look back our end steps. And then if when we look back, 
that's greater than or equal to zero. Okay, that is, we're not waiting to fill the buffer. Then we go ahead and calculate our discounted rewards. And then calculate the discounted value of that future state. And what we do here is basically say, if we're within t of the n, sorry, if we're within n of the n, we don't care about the terminal state. We know the terminal state's value is 0 anyway. And so we just look ahead n steps. If we're past the end, don't count it. Otherwise, use this value. And then do our normal update where g is our target. Would this need like a, also a convergent condition for breaking this infinite loop in case that you are actually in a uh, continuous task? Oh, I see, because we're trying to estimate. Um, or like we never set t to some finite thing. Yeah, we never do have any. You would have some reason to break out. You could either be looking at the v's and see whether they are converged or not. Mm -hmm. You do something like that. And could you also, the, the last thing you said about when uh, tau plus n is past the terminal state, we just don't do anything there? No, no. We don't have to change. OK, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just say, say that again? Yes. Uh, the, so the line right under where your hand is, where or two down, um, where you were saying that it would Oh, yeah. So basically, if we look n, um, n ahead from the one we're updating, mm -hmm. if it's off the end, don't bother looking at that value. Okay, but it's, if it's prior to that terminating, terminating time step, then go ahead and use the associated v. All right, let's try an example. Let's say we have Five states here. So this is terminal and this is terminal. And we are going to get a plus one here and a minus one here. And this is our start state. So we're going to call this start, left, and right. Maybe middle, left, and right. Okay? Terminal here, terminal here. Zero everywhere else. So let's say we start time step zero, and we'll use n equals three, let's say. Start in the middle. We go, and let's keep a Q, Q's here. So we're going to have Q of, left, middle, right. And our two actions are go left or go right. And we'll start out as our handy dandy zeros. And the policy is going to be mostly greedy. It's a little epsilon greedy, but I make up epsilon as we go. So we're going to start going left. Josh, you want to come up and do one step of this? Well, we're going to also. So we have n equals 3. So what you're going to do is update our reward 
and our state and update Q as necessary. So we only this is the, the the state transitions are just what you think of. And then they we only get rewards if you go into a terminal state. You only get rewards if you go into a terminal state. So we're in the middle and we move to the left, right? Yep. So reward is zero. Uh -huh. We are now in the leftmost state. Uh huh. And then Oh, and this is the time step. Oh, so it's just a good thing. Uh -huh. We have a reward of zero, so that cancels out with everything else. Yeah, right? It's zero. No. No. Here's why. What can you update at this point if n is 3? Wait, if n is 3? Yeah. Uh, we can update the middle, maybe? No. We can't, and the reason is, so if we were doing n of 1, that says take one step, look one step ahead, basically. Get the immediate reward and the next estimate. We need to look at the immediate reward the next reward, and the following reward. Oh, I see. So we don't have enough information yet to update. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Right, because our update is going to be Q of SA plus equals alpha, we'll have to make up what alpha is, R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus S prime, A prime, where the prime is like the one way down, right. three in the first. OK, so you're done. Uh, Jake. And if anyone has questions, throw them out. So which action am I taking? Uh, you're taking, um, that would be too easy. Right. Yeah, but just if I look at greedy, greedy is like, could be either one. So, right. Yes, sir. We don't know about the transition yet. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So, up, got a reward of zero. We're in the middle. Do we update anything? How many rewards do we have so far? Three. How many rewards do we have so far? Two. Okay, two. So, therefore, we know we're not, we don't have enough, right? Can't do it. All right, next, uh, Dave. Josh. Um, so, since like our rewards that we're getting already kind of match the queue, like the values that we are expecting, could that mean that we might converge too early because like we're noticing that like, oh, we have a reward of zero, it's matching our expected reward of zero, could we like, could that? We'd have to wait until like nothing is converging. Okay. Right? If something is converging, we're not done. All right, uh, which way do you want to go? What's greedy say to do? What? What does the greedy algorithm say to do? Uh, yeah, I mean, left or right. Uh, I actually had up for this example, and then it was like too many actions. And then, um, let's go right. Up and down, or just stay in the same spot, right? Yeah, exactly. That was, it was just to add more complexity for no purpose. Apparent purpose. Okay, so you agree with that? Yeah? Zero? Anything to update? I think so. Okay, talk to me. So there's three rewards now. Yep. Um, but oh, I forgot. These, these weren't zero. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, these were uh, one, wasn't it? Yeah, that fits the greedy actions I took. So they were one. Go ahead. Um, but then, I don't know the discount factor. Actually, that isn't quite right. This was one, zero, two, five, three, six. <laughs> Wait, that, that there is, remember, there's always epsilon in there, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. So, what's going to get up here? Q of SA. What's S and A? Uh, in fact, here, circle in red, what's going to get updated? What state action pair? <coughs> All right, good. So we're in time set three. 
We're looking back three steps. We can update at time step zero. All right, what do we want to update it to? Well, so what is the? It's one. One? Okay. Oh, and this is 0.5. I just said 0.5. Can you write it? I'm just guessing we're going to need this space in just a moment. Yes, yes. I have it right over there. One eventually gets to be just a master of, of board management. I hear. <laughs> what would this be as looking ahead for your boards? Future prediction. You make a lot of money off of it. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. I was predicting we would. All right, so the zero is these three, oh, say, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Let's just be easier. We know this can vector is one, right? Let's just say zero. And then Q of S prime. Yeah, what's S prime and A prime? This. Yeah. That's a good question. What state is it? And what action? We don't know yet. I mean, we don't know. We better take that action. So, so do we wait until the next person goes. So? Uh, it's greedy. <laughs> no, we're doing left. <clears throat> yeah. So wait. Why did you? Oh, because we're in. Because it's greedy. Okay. Yeah, it's a bad estimate right now. So. Yeah, and L is very confusing using my left arrow for here. Oh, no. yeah. States, actions. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. But then you have to subtract. And that's middle and lower left, so it's three. Three. This is three. This is zero, right? Yeah, it's, this is right. Is this correct? Is it correct? Is it correct? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Q of R left is so it's six. It's just one. Point. Oh, which you have right here. Yeah. So one point five. So one half of six minus three. Yeah. So our target is six. We're at a three. Or is this where we are? Yes, here. Our target is six, we're three, and so we should go up. Okay, so 4.5, right, make it so. This is not going to scale. Erasers do scale. Yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Make sense? We're looking back three. Uh, next one happens. We're we took left. We took, we took left. That's important to mark. No, we definitely took right because you said we're taking greedy action. Yeah, greedy. Greedy action is greedy. Oh, never mind. I can't understand arrows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's the whole color mark. Yeah. All right. <coughs> Julius. Take charge. Um, Sounds good. Uh, so you take left? Yes. So you go to the middle? What's yes. The zero? What's the reward? Zero. It's zero. There's zero everywhere except these two. So look back three time steps. Okay. All right. So click two. <coughs> Three. Well, here, there's two ways we can look at it. One, four minus three is one. Second, we just did this one. This must, must be next. Right. So, All right. Here, I'll circle it for you. 
And you don't have to write the whole equation, but if you want to, you can. Yeah, why don't we just write an L and a right arrow, right? L? So it's um, alpha? L1 is 0, gamma 0. And it's gamma, it's a zero there, that <coughs> means, right? One squared zero. Q. Q. Um, the next one. Wait, 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 nope. Here's the key. So remember, when we're doing one step, we take the immediate reward and then take this value. Two step, we take this immediate reward and this immediate reward and this take this value. Three step, this immediate reward, this immediate reward, this immediate reward, and this value. Does that make sense? So it's, so it's because we're taking these three steps, we've got to use three steps down for our value. So three what the state, the state in action value, three steps from here. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go right. I want to end this thing. So zero discounted immediate reward, right? This is um, this is zero. That one is zero. And this is um, left. This guy. So basically, our current estimate is one. Our new estimate is zero. So we're going to move half of the way between. Right? I mean, that's. I want you to think of it that way. And don't think of it as much of, I've got this long formula that I put in. right? It's, I've got a target, which is this. I've got my current value, which is this. Move me partway there. So my target is 0. My, cur my current estimate is 1. I want to move halfway there, because that's my uh, alpha. So this is 0. This is 0. Right, 1 plus equal negative 0.5. Yep. So this guy is. OK. Uh, Shannon. And we're going to get a terminal state at this point. Thank goodness. I'll make you some room. Uh, in fact, yeah, we're ending. I'll tell you. Oh, yeah, so we, we already decided step four, we moved right. Yes. Um, we can also update, update, update process again. If you want to do it in words, that's OK. But if you want to do it in formula, that's OK. Too. OK. So we're updating this guy, right? Yep. I'm looking at these three rows. Those three zeros, yep.
So our target is two, right? Is that right? Because it's zero, zero, zero plus this. This part? Yeah, this part. This is, isn't that two? Yes. Okay. This is two. I can write that. Yeah. And this whole thing is our target. This is our best estimate, right, of, of what this is. So our target is two. Our current value is. Zero. So we need to move 50% of the way from zero to two. Which I assume the math is going to tell us to do the same thing. Yep. So if you'll update the chart, the uh, Q. Yep. All right. And while you're sitting down, Nick. He is also foreseeing the future. Not far enough because he could reuse a lot of that. That's true. Zero. Okay, so now I am going here. Times that six, we get a reward of one from that. We're going to be in the terminal state. Okay. So we don't care what action we're in. Correct. Um, so now we're going to have whatever our Q estimate is. We want to update R and going left. And from there, we're going to have our alpha being one half. And then zero for the immediate reward, we wind up being in the terminal state, which also has a value of zero. Um, and our current estimate. Oh, no, 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 no. What's that for zero represent? The three rewards appear, right? Uh, which well, one? Well, sorry. Since we're starting here, we should be going these. So this should be actually one. I'm liking that better, right? Everyone agree immediate reward of the yeah. total is one? And a plus zero, it depends how we implement it, right? We can either talk about the terminal state, or we can just ignore it. Ignore it. Either either one is fine. Okay. So well, wait, right. does that make sense? Because the next ones we do, we're not going to have any. Yeah. Well, sure. Go ahead and put in the zero ones. I don't. I'm sorry. Can you explain that one more time? That the R one is supposed to be the one that like R four in this case, right? Yeah. This R one, yes would be R4. So is it, why is it a one? So I, I'm First, second, and third. Oh, okay. Yeah, he took, he, he like did multiplications by one, and he squared one, and cubed oh, one, like all in his head. Wow, sorry. <laughs> so. um, and then we're, our current estimate is um, right going left, which is a value of two. Whoa. Right? Whoa. Oh, sorry, I can't. <laughs> yeah, you and Bruno need to have some <laughs> remedial arrow training. Oh, sorry. So. Okay, so uh, we're getting negative five, negative five uh, so negative two point five. So our target is one, we're at six. We need to go halfway between one and six, two point five. Sounds good, why do you have minus? Uh, is it not subtraction? On the oh, it's still a plus equals negative two point five, is that where we're at? Yeah. Okay, so one to six. We're at six. We want to go to one. Halfway between six and one is 3.5. Six minus 2.5 is 3.5. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, so that's 3.5. All right, Sean, you're up. What actions are we taking? Uh, nothing. nothing. I like it. Okay. What state are we updating? There's state action. Do we just go through the not the like n minus one steps that they did here? So we start 
here, or do we just cut it off entirely? We basically, this is the next one. And if you want to try that fancy in your head stuff, you feel free. I'm going to shot. But you so need not. Q, uh, right. Uh, equals 0.5 times uh, 1. How many? You, you did three taps. Two. One. Because yeah. Nick did three taps. Now we're going to be down to two taps or two rewards, right? Mm -hmm. So zero with a no discount factor, one with a single discount factor. And now we will not do anything with any future, with any fine states, right? We've just taken the immediate rewards because that's all we get. And the expected value would be zero? Actually, hold on a second. The one squared, we don't have any one squared. Well, this is, this is the... This would be instead of like you get rid of this. Term, oh, oh, sorry. And this becomes a square, right? So, if we lose this one, we lose this one too. Oh, right. So if we look at it, okay. we know exactly what our reward is. It's this right. plus this one discounted, and then we're done. We know we're never getting any more reward. So there's no reason to do any updating. Target is one. So we have we're a one. One minus a one five. The value is half. Right? Doesn't seem reasonable. Let's see. <coughs> Our current estimate is one. Our target is one. How about this? You agree with that? Right. So, so it just stays one. Yeah, our target is one, our estimate is one. Sounds good. We'll just stay at one. All right. Carrots, not here. Nelson. <coughs> Bring it home. So, this is the tail end. We're not taking any steps, we're just going back and finishing our saved. Yep, yeah, we update that one. The reward is one. The reward is one. I agree. The target is one. Target is one. I agree. What's our current value? Two. So we just go halfway. Wow. <laughs> All right. So we got worse on this, but that makes sense because we're overestimating this. Right? We know the true value is always going to be one on this. And so we're going to get to one. Does the mechanics of it make sense? What do you want to use for n? It depends. Um, think of that as a hyperparameter that you'll be choosing for your problem. Okay. So sometimes you may want to go close to Monte Carlo with it, and you'll have a high end. Sometimes you want to close to TD zero, and you'll have a low end. And sometimes you know it'll be just right. In the middle. Can you have dynamic n, where either you have a smart n updating policy, or you just randomly choose an n random uh, like every time? Would that the There's no reason you could. There's no reason you could. It just would produce the best of no worlds, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not. So one problem with that is, as you're sam, you know, as you're randomly choosing an n, what's your upper bound? Lower bound is clear. Well, what, what, what is your upper bound going to be? 46. That's a reason. Reasonably good. So we were talking about the pairs we're taking the TD and the Monte Carlo. Like, we're saying that like Monte Carlo basically converges into like basically by step, like it calculates all the states and like the states. So that was the difference. And but like in this case, if we're using n state, like that's also only happening like one state. Action here, like how is that like? Why are we choosing like n step over just one step? Well, the n step over one step allows us to 
it allows us to take more of the future into account of this particular episode, right? The one step just uses the immediate future and the um, taking more of the future into account is more precise because we actually see what rewards we got as opposed to just uh, using our estimate of the next state or the next state action pair to uh, represent that. So I'm going to describe that more. More accurate, but you're having to wait longer. Right? Another thing that happens is in TD, we're, we're updating our Q estimates on every single step. Right? And so that is making the next step that you take better. Right? Your estimates are updated more quickly. So for and they would be in Monte Carlo. So for that purpose, like, um, can we run like Monte Carlo like on the end step rather than just like updating one state reward action pair? We just update like all the end steps. All the end on Monte Carlo, we always update all of them. Yeah, like I'm saying, like for the next step. But that's not true. We either first visit or every visit. If it's every visit, we update all. Yeah. So if we apply like the every visit Monte Carlo on the end steps, would that be better? That's what I'm trying to understand. What, so when we have Monte Carlo uh -huh. uh, and end steps. Yeah. So if you kind of just like extract the end steps out from the whole episode. OK, so let's say we look at a Monte Carlo. Right? We've got a, let me see if I understand. And you're saying we extract like some end steps in here? Yeah, like, like what we did like with the end step T. Yeah, okay. okay, and? Then like we just use like the subset as uh, like a data set to calculate the, to estimate the, um, Reward, this is when we're doing Monte Carlo? Um, is this a modification of the Monte Carlo algorithm or a modification of the TD algorithm? Well, it's a combination of both. Okay, so remember Monte Carlo doesn't bootstrap, right? Monte Carlo doesn't care what your initial values are. It actually just samples and uses, um, uses samples to come up with values. TD, even in step TD, is bootstrapping, right? Because as you get the in, as you look forward in the future, Eventually, you have to come up with, okay, what's, and what's it worth then? Right? I got real rewards, but then what do I use as that future value? So if you're not doing full Monte Carlo all the way to the end, where you get an entire return, then you are going to need to be doing bootstrapping. Now, given that, what's, what, is, what are you talking about that is different from end step TD? Like just getting like a results from applying Monte Carlo like to that and get like an estimate of that, then apply the bootstrapping like to that, compare that to the original value and apply. Okay. But it seems like it seems like the variable like within that end step you're doing like yeah. a variable n as well. Yeah. Like so then you oh. have these n things and then you not only update the thing that's at the end of the chain, but you also do Right before that, you update that using like an n minus one step, and the one before it with like an n minus two step. Yeah. Oh, I see. I think I understand. So, correct me if I'm wrong. We're going to use n step. We, we we take we take a new step. We look back in. We update that with a with a TDN, and then we update the one bef after that with a TDN minus one, and update that with a TDN minus two, and so on. Because we do have new information on those. That is a reasonable approach. Um, the, that is something we may or may not get into. There's what's called TD Lambda. So TD Lambda is this approach where every step you go back and update everything in the, everything in the past. Okay? And there's... Uh, um, so it's not dissimilar, actually, from, from what you are talking about, except it is even somewhat more generalized. Uh, so kind of off of that, kind of off, I think, what we talked a couple classes ago. If we were to run 
this algorithm again on the same data. Monte Carlo would not give us any any new information, but running TV on, again on this um, on this single data set would give us more information and eventually we form values that converge to what Monte Carlo would give us, right? Yeah, so Monte Carlo, um, Monte Carlo is getting new information too, right? Because we're getting more and more returns that we're averaging together. Well, I guess it, running Monte Carlo on the same data set wouldn't help. Oh, I see, on the yeah, same data set. Yeah, that's that idea of converging on the same right. data set. Yeah, TV, we could do the same data set. converge to yeah. the same values as Monte Carlo in this case, right? If we're just running it on this. Episode. No. no. TD, TD and Monte Carlo are going to converge to different. TD is going to converge to the MDP that is most likely given what we saw here. If we ran this again and again. But you're right, if we ran the exact same thing again and again, we would be updating our value. And that's where we get into kind of the, uh, in, a, in a few chapters, the Dyna algorithm, where we, we do some planning. And the idea is kind of we save what we did, and we can relive it and do some TD and updates, because of exactly what you point out. In some sense, there's still some juice to be squeezed out of this. Right? Because if we ran it again and again, we'd get some different values. All right, uh, program assignments. Do Tuesday? I believe it's on Tuesday. Um, so, and, we'll have a, and there's a homework, and we have a quiz on Monday. <laughs> I'll be in the cafe.